Alright, um, number three, uh, the narrative must be contextualized, and contextualization is very, very important. This is an actual technical term. I might, depending, I, I'll see, I'll vibe it, and see um, how much detail I want to give to contextualize it, uh, contextualization and what it means and the significance of contextualization, but as I said before, um, this analysis is an introductory account. I don't want to, you know, go into any depth of you know, any particular point. Rather, I just want to give a very sort of survey, a very broad survey of all the points, of all the different forms that I'm going to be discussing. All right, um, so the importance of contextualization. All right, so the narrative must be contextualized. And what does this mean? Well, let's look at uh, the significance of contextualization. In contextualizing, what we do is we offer meaning to the narrative account. Right? There has to be, and in the last half of this first series on narrative, um, on narrative research, I talked about the role of meaning. Right. So we have to contextualize meaning. And what did I put? Meaning of merit. So we have to offer, offer meaning. In contextualizing our data, right, in putting our data within a, a framework, right, in putting our data within a framework. We contextualize the data. So, um, for example, if I am, the example that I gave in the last half of the video, if I'm interested in collecting stories from, um, let's say, uh, Jamaicans who left at a very young age uh, and comparing that against Jamaicans who stayed on the island for their whole, uh, for their whole life, and I want to do like a comparison and contrast against um, various members of the Jamaican community, um, the framework with which I might analyze this data, what they told me in the story, might be post-colonial theory. Right? If I'm interviewing um, civil rights era activists, women's activists, I might use a feminist model, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. So this framework is going to be my theoretical framework. I'm going to use that theoretical framework to contextualize, to ascribe meaning, to offer meaning to my data. As I said before, this is a completely different form of qualitative research from, let's say, grounded theory. Grounded theory would be just the opposite, right? Instead of applying theory to the data to contextualize, to, to sort of distill meaning in what was said, it's the data that serves as a source for um, the creation of the theory. So it's, and I, I don't want to jump ahead because for those of you who don't know about grounded theory, it's just too much too soon. Just uh, take note that um, one of the ways that we offer or ascribe meaning to the information that we collect is that we select from the appropriate, uh, and there's many, many um, theoretical frameworks that we use in order to make sense of the data that we get. Uh, the example that I gave was a post-colonial theoretical framework. Um, there are many, many other frameworks that you might use, uh, and your instructors and whoever's gotten your research will tell you what they feel um, is the best theoretical framework to make sense to interpret the data that you received, right? So in, in doing that, in applying a theoretical framework to the data, you're contextualizing, you're offering meaning to the data, right? Now I can understand the significance of his statement that dot, 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 because that dot, 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 conforms to this, this theoretical model. And here's how that theoretical model better makes sense of his statement, fill in the blank. Okay. Number two, um, it's important, contextualization is important because it creates the condition for, and for me, I think this is the most, the most important, personally, um, for me, it creates, contextualization creates the conditions for empathic responses, right? It creates the condition creates the condition for empathic responses. Right. You want to, as a researcher, um, be able to, and I, I'll talk about this later because this is an actual technical term, you want to be able, in the interview, to be able to create what's known as a discursive, and actually I'll talk about it now, um, discursive. You want to be able to create a discursive space. It's not a well, I guess in a sense, ontologically it might be, but um, you want to create a space. I'm here, the researcher, the participants there, 
I want to be able to create a space in which the participant feels comfortable enough with me as a person, as Jason, to be able to disclose very, very personal information about his or her life. Right? Knowing that the IRB is sort of regulating all the ethical concerns and how I'm going to use this information to generalize it, blah, 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 blah. Right? But I want to be able to create a discursive, almost informal space. Right? If the interview is too much of this robotic sort of you know, uh, microphone passing, so tell me about your experience as uh, a single mother. It was really hard. Man, tell me about the experience of getting your kids through school. It was, you know, you're going to have this very robotic, you know, your, your research is not going to be good. The data that you collect is not going to be good. Um, you need to establish a relationship with the participant and be genuine in this relationship with your participant, right? Because participants know that, oh, he's just buttering me up because he wants some information, right? Um, one thing that I do, just as a quick side note, one thing that I do to assist in sort of, uh, you know, fostering this disturbative space, a space in which the participant feel comfortable is that I let the participants know my intent, right, right from the beginning. My intention in this interview, in collecting the data from you, in collecting your story, in recording your story, is to let you know that I'm going to try and and make sense of some of the atrocities that we've gone through, and hopefully, um, you know, suppress uh, or hamper the likelihood that it will happen again. If you if you telling your story can help me, I have a very large um, uh, I have a very large audience of people that I can that I can um, affect, and your story then has a, a larger platform that it can reach more people. So just use me as a conduit to get your story out there. And I mean, people recognize that you're trying to do some good and they'll be willing to talk to you then, right? You can get so much more out of your interview if you create that space, right? In creating that space, what we recognize is that we can really get the emotion, right? We can have the reader, um, who goes back, you can, not just your committee members, but you know, if you decide to publish your dissertation into a book or whatever you do with that, um, or research articles, my dissertation, I, I, I got research publications out of it, book publications out of it, you want it more than just to be, you know, just sort of the facts of the matter, stating the facts of the matter, unless that's the type of qualitative research that you're doing, then that's fine. For me, it had to be more empathic, I'm talking about the Holocaust, I'm talking about evil, I'm talking about suffering. Um, you can't talk about that without recognizing that the individual human being is suffering, that the individual human being is experiencing this. So it's important to recognize that we want to have an empathic um, response from the participant. Don't force it um, so that when we go back to analyze the data, when we go back to make sense of what was, was stated, the reader can empathize with the plight of the individual if that is sort of the governing mode of your research. Now, if that doesn't pertain to, if empathy isn't, um, and, and suffering and so on and so forth, isn't, and it's more of just like a sort of historical sense of who this person's biography, um, this person's life story might have been, then fine. Um, but for the most part, empathy factors heavily, heavily into qualitative research and the really, really good qualitative researchers from the fair qualitative research can elicit a sense of empathy within the reader because it's at that point that they bring out the wallet and they want to write the check to the organization to help dot 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 right there is some operative suggestions that are that are stated let's get something done not just here are the facts so that's just my particular bias so that's number two I think that's very important um, the narrative research uh, must be contextualized um, because it serves as a better expression of the subject's experience right it's a better you can use representation, representation of, it's about a representation of experience, right? The subject, the subject's experience is better represented when the subject's experience is contextualized. For me, I would go further, right? I'm a, I'm a philosopher. Now, this is not to say that everybody would use sort of my model because, you know, I, sociologists might not need it, this level of complexity. Anthropologists might not need it. For me, um, as a philosopher, um, the better representation of experience when we're talking about contextualization requires that um, the researcher embody the participant, right? So what is the social demography of the participant? This participant is a white, female, single mother, uh, impoverished community, da 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 ba 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 Here's who she is. So you can really, really visually see who she is when you're reading the narrative, right? When you're going through the story. Um, in doing that, in understanding who the quote-unquote character is, 
the, the reader is more likely to empathize with the character because the reader can see who she is, right? Obviously, we're going to be using pseudonyms. That's a given. But we want to make sure that the meaning that we have and the meaning that we're trying to arrive at in collecting this data and the, the, the points of our research isn't lost because we've depersonalized the subject's experience, right? The subject's experience is imperative. And part of that subject's experience is the subject. So it, it's important that, uh, for me at least, um, and the way, that I would, uh, the way that I do govern my graduate students' research, is that I want to know who the subjects are, right? We know it's going to be pseudonyms, but tell me a little bit, give me a little bit of a background information on the subject, who they are, what their life experience is in a blurb, in a paragraph, two paragraphs. The reader reads it and they have some contextualization of who this person is, and then when the person is relaying his or her story later through transcriptions and especially through the theoretical sort of interpretation of what was stated, the reader remembers, oh yeah, Mary, I, I know who she is. I, I, I have an image of her in my mind, right? So for me, uh, it's a better representation of the subject's experience. It's a better representation of, of, the, uh, of the subject.